Hello, welcome everybody. <clears throat> You can see it's uh, 7 p.m. now here in Paris and uh, I know that we have uh, participants from all over the world World, and um, let's see so um, I think there are still a few people there that are joining us so I'll wait a little bit for them uh, but first I want to thank our hosts um, BenQ, Wix uh, Photo and Video and Calibrite for hosting this webinar this evening. Um, let's see, um, I think, yeah, so there are still some people that are trying to connect but I will just mention it to you guys that um, this webinar will be recorded. So you will receive a link to the replay 24 hours uh, later. And um, I think I will start the presentation now. I will remove my um, the video so we can see the entire presentation. There we go. Um, Sorry, I cut you off from the presentation, but now you should be able to see the first slide. And I'm just going to remove another window that we have there. Okay, perfect. So, um, yeah, I think most of the people are connected now, so I will begin with the presentation. So, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Solly. Uh, I'm working as a full-time food photographer and um, I have a background as an engineer and I've also been working with uh, online marketing almost my entire professional life until I decided to invest in my passion which is photography but also videography. I'm originally from Sweden but I'm based in Paris since um, more than 13 years and uh, it was actually here in Paris that my uh, passion for photography was born. It was the magical light uh, that put a spell on me, but also the beautiful um, architecture, the history and um, the everyday life and the gastronomy, of course. So these are a few pictures that I've been taking here in Paris. And I think everybody who I've been visiting Paris, they know exactly what I'm talking about when I'm uh, saying that the light is special. Um, I do many types of photography, but food photography is my main occupation. And uh, I'm also a Nikon uh, partner and an ambassador for uh, Calibrite. And I'm also an AQ Color BenQ expert. And you can see most of my work um, on my portfolio website but also my um, Instagram account so I have two different um, Instagram accounts I have one that is um, let's see if I can move the mouse okay here we go so um, Soli food is uh, fully dedicated to uh, my food photos and then I have another account that is called Soli underscore K here uh, where I post um, landscape photography in particular in particular Paris and other trips. And uh, during the pandemic, um, I, when I went through several lockdowns here in Paris, I created a YouTube channel. And here you have the link. So there you can find. Um, so I created a YouTube channel devoted to food photography. So there you can find um, a few food photography tutorials and it's something that I'm updating uh, continuously. So there will be more videos coming up soon. And um, I've also been shortlisted in the prestigious Pink Lady Food Photographer of the year 2020, 21 and 23 with some of uh, these photos that you can see here. But enough about me. Uh, today we are here to learn how to achieve color accurate um, workflow for food photography. And uh, before starting, I just want to present you the agenda so you know what I will cover. Um, so to get accurate, uh, accurate color in a photo, the light is important. And that's what I will go through in the first part of this webinar. And um, then I will explain what a color checker is. 
and also how uh, to use it. And I will also talk a little bit about the benefits of editing on a color accurate uh, monitor. And then we will finish with a Q&A in the end. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to write them in the chat box and uh, I'll go through them in the end. So I guess that's it. I'll move on to the next slide. So if you would ask me what's the most important uh, thing in food photography, then I would say light right away and not a beautiful dish because you could actually have the most beautiful dish but if you don't get the lighting right it will not highlight the beauty of the dish so with the right lighting you can highlight textures like for example in this picture here a salad leaf and you can see the beautiful textures with the light that is hitting from behind and um, you highlight the colors like these flowers and um, macarons but also um, small details, like here I've sliced um, a lemon and you can see all the small details thanks to the light. Um, but with the wrong lighting, let's move on to the next light. Uh, this, oh sorry. But with the wrong light, um, or rather in existing lighting, um, the dish might look um, not very inviting and uh, unappealing like uh, this picture. So this is a photo I took in a restaurant while having dinner. And as you can see, there was uh, barely any light. So it was pretty difficult to get a beautiful picture of the dish. But um, it is possible to save this photo and uh, fix it. And I'm just going to quickly show you the result. So this is the original photo and uh, here I have um, edited it in Lightroom. However, since um, I have increased, let's see here, so this is the original photo and here I have edited it in uh, Lightroom. But as you can see, um, when I increase the exposure and um, open up the shadows, you can see all these uh, the gray that is very grainy because there is a lot of noise since it was a dark um, picture, and that's not very appealing. So um, if you have, uh, then I edited uh, even more in Lightroom. So I don't know if you have um, updated um, or or if you're using Lightroom and have updated to the latest version but you can actually fix the noise pretty well with a new denoise tool and I'm just going to show you the results so this is the final image and uh, here I used the um, the latest uh, denoise tool in Lightroom and this is just a close up so you can see the difference between the, uh, the final results and the first um, picture where I had edited it in Lightroom. And uh, so it is possible to um, fix um, a dark picture from that was taken in a low light scene, but you would waste quite a lot of time in the post-production process, which is unnecessary. And um, why do that when you can use correct lighting from the beginning? And um, you can either choose to work with uh, natural light or artificial light in any kind of photography, but today we're going to talk about food photography. Um, and when I was doing food photography a few years ago as um, a hobby, I still had an office job. So uh, my time to shoot food was very limited. I could never shoot during the weekdays because I left early to the office and I came home quite late after a sunset. So um, the light was very uh, low and um, this meant I only had the weekends to um, photograph food. 
Um, and I continued like that for a few years um, because um, yeah, shooting with artificial light was quite terrifying for me. Um, I had the impression that it was very complicated and um, the technical terms kept me away from my artificial light for a long time until I decided that it was about time to uh, learn it and face my fears. And uh, today, now when I'm working as a full-time um, photographer, um, I could use the natural light, uh, which I do sometimes, uh, but working professionally, I can't really depend 100% on natural light because the sun is changing all the time, which means that you have uh, changed the settings of your camera uh, while you're shooting. And uh, with artificial light, um, you will have the control of the strength of the light and once uh, you set the, um, the settings of your light you don't need to change the settings of your camera so you can do the shooting any time of the day. So here while, uh, if you're using artificial light you would be in control and when you're using um, natural light you, you really don't have the control because you have to adapt after the sun. And um, it's, let's see here on this picture. So it's not very easy to see only by looking at a photo if the light in the scene is artificial or natural. So like here in these two pictures that I've taken, um, when, I used, uh, when I used to show these two pictures to people, most people think that I took this uh, to the right one in um, outdoors using natural light and this one uh, using a flash but it's actually the opposite so when i was taking this picture it was indoors and um, i was using an artificial light and um, here i was using um, i had put the plates um, uh, near the window so I could uh, use the natural light and um, so let's see and uh, artificial light is also great when you want to take action shots like these two ones so here I'm using I think it's flower um, that I'm capturing the movement of the flower and that I, where I'm dusting the flower and here is um, a glass of wine and I'm capturing the motion of the wine. So um, in these type of photos um, you need to um, increase the shutter speed so you need more light in your scene and that's why uh, I shot them using artificial light. And um, if you're not using artificial light and still want to use um, natural light, you need to have quite strong natural light. So it should be during midday because in the morning and evening, the, um, the strength of the light is quite um, weak. And um, so you should do it during daytime. And um, if the natural light still is not enough, then I would suggest that you compensate it by increasing the ISO, but not too much because then you could get too much uh, noise um, in the image. And uh, let's have a look on the differences between flash and uh, LED lights because we have um, different artificial lights and uh, LED lights, uh, they produce a continuous and consistent light source, which is um, essential when you're capturing food, for example. And uh, they also offer a broader range of color temperature as you can adjust it manually. And um, on the other hand, uh, flash or strobe, um, they um, produce a powerful burst of light that can freeze uh, emotion and create dramatic effects like you saw in, on, the slide, uh, on the previous slide. But um, the uh, flash and strobe, they can be a bit more challenging to control and uh, you might have to take a few shots 
to be sure to achieve the result that you want. And uh, with a LED light, if you're using a LED light, then you would actually see the result with your eyes because you can see how, how much light you have in the scene. And um, personally, I have both uh, LED lights and flash or strobes um, and the LED lights I use for um, all my videos and um, all my videos and also my uh, stop motions because in stop motion um, animation there you need to because you're taking many pictures and you need to have constant uh, lighting so to um, to avoid flickering in the um, in the animation so then it's a must to use a LED light. And uh, the first image that you saw in this presentation, I actually took with a LED light. So um, it was the picture with the oranges. And um, that picture I took with um, a LED light from the new brand Hobo Light. And this is the light that you can see here. So it's um, a word winning brand that specializes in high quality LED lights and as you can see it has a beautiful uh, vintage look and here you can see that you can um, adjust the strength of the light but also the um, color temperature so that's very practical and um, yeah, I don't know if yeah I mentioned it that if you see with a LED light you can directly see in your camera or with your eyes how much light you have in the scene. So it's you don't need to take uh, many test shots as you would have done with um, with a flash. And um, Hobolite, they also, so this is the kit that I tried out from Hobolite. So they have um, not only, yeah, they have three different LED lights. So they have a mini and Avant that I have here and a Pro that is a bit more bigger and more powerful. And they also have accessories like soft boxes, lanterns and uh, color gels. And um, so this is the be behind the scenes the picture of the, the picture that you could see in the beginning of the slide of the oranges. Um, so this is the setup. So here is the, um, the LED light. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just going to drink a little bit of water. Um, so this, so here I'm using the LED light and um, a softbox, and I have attached the um, a backdrop here. And here I'm using a um, blackboard, um, a phone card in uh, black, and. Um, yeah, I'm just using one uh, light source because it's a dark and moody uh, food photo. And um, here I've taken pictures of more oranges and I'm just going to show you that you can't really see which one is taken with a flash or a LED light. So this is I think this one was taken with um, a flash and this one is taken with a LED light. So yeah, it's difficult to see if you wouldn't have known in advance which one has been taken with what kind of artificial light. Um, but of course, if you're going to use, if you're going to do um, capture motion, then I would suggest that you use a more, you need more powerful uh, light source. And uh, let's move on to light modifiers. So um, there are a lot of accessories that you can use to modify light. As you saw on the previous slide, I was using a softbox. And um, a softbox is uh, good because it spreads the light evenly. So this is a softbox. And it doesn't give any hard shadows. So um, I often use it for light and airy scenes. And in my dark and moody food photos, I'm using a honeycomb grid. So it's a grid that you can um, attach to your softbox. And um, it reduces the light waste and uh, you get a more concentrated light to your object. And you can also use a diffuser. So you can just uh, hang it in front of your, um, yeah, in, in front of your artificial light if you're using a LED light or um, 
a flash, but you can also use it when you're shooting outdoors to diffuse the um, the natural light, or if you're using or if you're shooting indoors near a window. So if you're using the natural light, you can just um, have the diffuser um, near the window, so you have the light that is going through the diffuser before it hits uh, the scene that you're going to photograph. And uh, you can also use uh, foam boards, uh, foam cards. Um, you have them in black and uh, white. And I have many of these. These are a bit, yeah, I think around five millimeter thick. And um, they exist in different sizes and they're very good to have because uh, I use the white uh, when I want to reflect the light and then I use the black when I want to block the light. So as you could see in this, uh, no, I think here, I was using a black uh, foam card because I wanted to block the light in this scene. And um, let's go on to the direction of um, light. So um, I think, yeah, I wanted us to quickly analyze um, the direction of the light because that's also important when you're using lights um, in your scene and uh, to see uh, how important the light's position is and how it affects the object and uh, where the shadow is falling. Because you can see this is the same um, object and I have um, the camera is on the same uh, position but I have uh, moved around the, um, the light source around the object. And I'm just going to show you on the next slide. So for example, here, here I um, uh, directed the lights on, uh, uh, on the object from the left side. So you can see we have um, the, uh, the light is falling here. So we have a um, highlight here, and then the shadow is falling to the on the right side and uh, then we can choose to um, direct the light from the front then the shadow would end up behind the object and uh, this direction of light is used more used in portrait photography uh, because when you're taking a portrait you don't want to um, show, uh, I mean, we don't want to show the shadows on someone's face. So um, we need a lot of light. But in food photography, it's the opposite. We do want some shadows so we can um, see the beauty of textures because otherwise, if we would uh, position the light in front of our object, um, the object would be very flat like you can see in this picture we wouldn't we would lose all the texture so um, i often use the lights on one of the sides so either the left or right so here um, i uh, put the light behind the um, the object so you can see that it's lit up here you have the highlight here and we have the shadow that is falling in front and uh, this is very beautiful in particular when you're doing um, and you're shooting um, drinks like in this picture because then we have a beautiful highlight here and um, you can see that the light is going through the glass so um, if you shoot drinks then i would um, suggest to use uh, backlight And this is my lighting setup that I mentioned earlier. Um, so no matter if I'm shooting a bright scene or a dark, I often use uh, one light source and uh, one um, bounce card on the opposite side. So here I have, um, so here if, uh, I have my camera, the object, and uh, the light source, and then I position a bounce card in the opposite, so in the other side. So if this would have been a light and airy scene, then I would use a white um, bounce card. And if it's a dark and moody, I would use a black um, 
black bounce card. So apart from light, we um, also need to get the colors right in a photo. And it's even more crucial in food photography because um, food is something we all can relate to as uh, we want to create an interest and hopefully also um, evoke an, um, an appetite. Um, so that's why it's important to get the colors right as well and not only the light. And um, the first thing you should ask yourself is if the white balance is correct. Because uh, even if the object, like for example here, I've taken a picture of milk. Uh, so even if the object that you're photographing is white, it doesn't mean that it will remain white in your image. Because it could be having a blue tint or a warm tint, like here. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with white balance, I will explain in short what it is and um, how it's measured and how you can set the white balance. So a light source can either be described as warm, neutral, uh, like here, or so warm, neutral, or uh, cold. And um, uh, these graduations are defined as color temperature and they're measured in Kelvin. And uh, this is a color char uh, temperature chart that you can see here to the right. And uh, here you can see that the warmer or more yellow uh, the light is, it has a lower degree of, uh, sorry, here, uh, it has a lower degree of Kelvin. And the more cooler it is, it has um, a higher degree of Kelvin. So this means that the color temperature of the light affects what our camera is capturing. So even if our eyes would see an object as white, like this milk, um, our camera is not as intelligent and it can't adjust automatically to different color temperatures like our eyes can do. So uh, here we have a bottle of milk and um, you know, it's, we all know that uh, milk is white. But depending on the light source that you're using, it can either get a warm tint, like here, or a cold tint. And um, you can correct the white balance um, in different ways. You can either set the white balance manually in your, um, in your camera uh, by taking a close-up photo of 18% 18, 18 uh, gray card, but you can also use a color temperature meter or a color chart. And personally, I prefer using a color chart um, because it has more reference points and provide uh, more precise colors. So um, here's another picture that I've taken and um, where I'm using a color chart from uh, Calibrite. And um, I thought it would be interesting to show you how I'm using it. So this is the original photo. And um, you can see that it's quiet a bit dull because the strawberries are not very vibrant. They don't have this vibrant red and this turquoise color is not very vibrant. It's quite uh, dull. And um, uh, that's why I use a color checker. So, um, um, so it's a very powerful tool because um, when you're, sh especially when you're shooting in control lighting and um, so not only in food photography, because when I'm doing uh, product photography, it's even more uh, important to use a color checker because it's very important to get the color of the products right. And um, so here we have the scene with a bowl of strawberries and um, it's very quite dull and flat. And uh, I have placed the color checker here. So um, the first thing you need to think of is to, um, you have to shoot in RAW and you have to place the color checker uh, near your object. And uh, whenever the lighting changes in your scene, you have to take a new um, picture with the color checker inside the scene. So um, let's have a look on this example. and. Um, the size of the um, color checker should at least take up 10% of the frame. 
and uh, you should avoid uh, filling your entire frame with it because you could uh, vignetting could uh, occur uh, and that would affect the color rendering and uh, you should also make sure to um, position the passport in parallel to the plane of your lens and uh, make sure it's not tilted and um, to um, to create a color profile that is uh, accurate uh, it's very important that the passport is in focus you should put the focus point on the passport when you're taking uh, this um, this reference image and um, here i'm going and also make sure that it's uh, perfectly exposed so uh, i'm just going to explain because then it only takes less than one minute in lightroom to um, uh, with the procedure so i'm just going to show you so if you're using lightroom you just need to go to um, file export with preset and then here you're choosing color checker camera calibration and then you are asked to name uh, to name it so uh, then you just um, create a name and then you restart uh, lightroom and then you look for the picture so either this reference image or the um, the other picture the test image and um, you click here you click on profile and uh, then you browse you click on browse and there you'll find the profile that you created so here you can see so this is, takes less than one minute and here you can see the before image and the after so you can see that the red is more vibrant and the turquoise color uh, color as well and after this you can continue to um, retouch uh, the photo but um, from here you um, yeah you can continue to edit but at least you know that the colors that you're editing are true to life so um, it much easier and uh, you wouldn't waste your time in order to find the correct um, turquoise um, color or the right um, red color for the raspberries and here is a close-up so you can see how um, the yeah even if the difference is yeah it's not a huge difference but you can see it's a subtle difference and you can see that it's the strawberries are more uh, vibrant and um, yeah, I just also wanted to um, to add that um, Calibrite, they just released a new product. So it's a target holder and um, you can, um, it's very practical because you can um, use it for holding your color checker. So, um, and um, it's a uh, multi size so you can it's you can use it for the small color checker and also the bigger ones and you can use um a light stand and um it's uh, fully adjustable with the uh, foam pads that you can see there and here and then you just insert your color checker and it's much easier to have it in your scene and um, when it comes to photography having the right monitor is also essential especially if you print but also if you um, publish your photos uh, online and uh, for a long time i used the screens of my um, imac because i had an imac like 10 years ago uh, but also my macbook pro for post-processing my photos uh, but that was until I discovered that there were monitors um, spe specifically um, designed for photographers. So today I'm using uh, this monitor from BenQ. So it's a 32 inch um, panel monitor and um, it's very powerful. And um, I highly recommend it because um, I love taking uh, close up shots like you have seen. Um, so uh, when I work uh, with a 32 inch monitor then I can really uh, see all the details and uh, retouch all the details so it's much easier than if I would have um, a small uh, monitor 
but um, yeah, BenQ, they have a whole series of monitors in different sizes uh, that are for photographers. And um, another important feature uh, that most of these monitors have in common is that the size of the screen is um, either 24 inches or bigger. And um, they provide an excellent work experience and um, exceptional accuracy of details and textures at 4K uh, resolution. And uh, these monitors, they also cover 100% of uh, the sRGB uh, color space. And um, sRGB color space is used for publishing images uh, on the web. So uh, on your website, um, everything that is uh, online. And 99% uh, Adobe RGB, uh, which is a color space that is used for preparing images for print. So thanks to these uh, color spaces, um, you can see more realistic color representation in your photos. And um, yeah, I've also written that it has an IPS panel. And um, I think that's very important um, that when you're choosing a monitor for photography editing, that the monitor has the IPS panel. And IPS uh, stands for in-plane switching. So it means that it ensures that the saturation and contrast remain consistent, regardless uh, of the angle that you're looking at the screen from. So um, that's very important. So you can adjust the photo, uh, no matter what angle uh, you're looking at the photo from. and um, I previously, before this 32-inch uh, uh, monitor, I was using a smaller monitor from BenQ, which I was very pleased with as well. And um, as I mentioned, they have a whole series of uh, monitor for photographers. And uh, what I also like with this one, uh, this, this um, model, is that it has um, a matte uh, finish that makes my photos look like prints because I'm not a big fan of a uh, glossy or shiny um, fin uh, finish of uh, a monitor because they reflect a lot. So I think this is great. And um, this is the picture I've taken from behind just so you can see the size. I mean, 32 inch is quite big, but it, as you can see, it's very slim. So it doesn't take up um, a lot of space on the desk and um, I also want to mention the calibrate um, that is important to calibrate your monitor because it is important to have a good monitor for photography but you need to make sure to calibrate the monitor too so uh, when you work on your images you want to be sure that you are seeing the real colors that your camera sensor was able to capture but unfortunately, our um, displays and um, graphic cards, um, including mobile devices, are made by different technologies and materials. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, like me, uh, before when I was checking, let's say if I had edited um, an image in on my laptop, then I send it to my mobile, and then I would see that the colors were not matching. So, um, and that's because you haven't, um, yeah, calibrated your monitor. So um, if you have a look at the same image in your monitor and in your laptop, you would most likely notice some differences. And um, for this reason, in order to have an image ready to be print or to, um, if you want to publish it online on the web, uh, you need to uh, calibrate your monitor and that's, uh, then you need, um, a colorimeter sensor as well. So uh, here I'm using the probe from um, from Calibrite, and um, uh, together with the software, I can um, I Calibrite the uh, monitor at least uh, twice a month, so every second week, and. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but on my blog, uh, I have written um, a step-by-step -step guide on how you can calibrate, calibrate your monitor, and it really doesn't take a lot of time. 
so um, just make sure to do it twice a month and um, uh, when you have a calibrated uh, screen and an ICC profile, um, different monitors can finally communicate with each other by numerically describing the colors that are displayed on the screen. So that way your printer can communicate with your um, laptop and you would get the same color everywhere, even if you would send it to your mobile and publish it on social media or on your website. So make sure to um, calibrate your monitor twice a month and keep it happy. And uh, I think that's um, I think that's the end of the webinar. And um, let's see um, before we move on to the Q and A session. I'm just going to see. So I can see we have a lot of questions, uh, but I also wanted to mention that um, Wex Photo and Video, they have a special offer for you and uh, you can find it in the chat box. So let's see. Yeah, so now it's uh, being posted. So um, there is a um, discount code, Calibrite 10. And uh, if you would use the code, you will get 10% off Calibrite until 12th May. So you can use the link there. And um, they also have this offer. So uh, where you get the um, the target holder. Um, so the target holder that I uh, mentioned in my um, uh, in their presentation. So it that you can use with your color checker passport. So that's there you have the code and um, I think I'll turn on the video now and see if we have, hello, I'm back. So let's see if we have any questions and feel free to add more. I'm just going to uh, open the chat. Let's see. So sorry, I'm just reading, uh, trying to find uh, the questions. So we have one question from Meg and I will read it out loud so you know what it is. Um, if I want to use uh, natural light, is there any specific time during the day it's better to shoot? That's a very good question. Um, and I don't think I mentioned it in the presentation. So um, in the morning, uh, we have this uh, soft light and uh, also in the evening, so that's, when I'm when when I'm, pref when I'm pref uh, preferring to um, photograph if I'm using natural light, but uh, if you like to have um, harsh lights in your scene and hard uh, shadows, then the perfect time would be to shoot during um, midday, so around noon. But then, of course, it depends um, if you, there is a lot of clouds because clouds would um, work as a diffuser for um, the light. So um, it totally depends on what kind of day. But if you want to have a soft light, then I would recommend you to shoot in the morning or later in the afternoon before the sun is setting. And let's see if we have other questions. Um, we have a question from Joe. Uh, what kind of artificial light would you recommend to a beginner? A very good question. Um, I think I would recommend a LED light because uh, with a LED light you would immediately see um, how the light is, how much light you have in your scene, and how it's affecting uh, the food that you have. So um, whereas with a flash or a strobe, you have to take a few test shots and um, you'll get to know the light with experience. But if you're starting out, I think the best is to um, use a LED light because then you can see uh, the results uh, immediately. And then of course you can use um, other kind of accessories to uh, modify the light as well. Um, Let's see if we have other questions. Um, let's see. And then we have one from uh, Neil. 
uh, I thought that the BenQ monitor had hardware built in for the color uh, calibration, and that's true. They have um, BenQ. They have um, a software, so um, uh, that is a built built inside. I mean, they have a software that you can use, and um, you can use there to calibrate. And I know that. Um, Calibrite, they also have a software for their probe, but you can use their probe uh, together with BenQ's software and Calibrite the monitor, so that's perfectly fine. So that's, and then, mm, uh, let's see if we have other questions. Uh, we have a question from Jack. If I have good natural light, should I use artificial light to enhance the image? Very good question. Um, well, sometimes um, it totally depends on what kind of scene you're trying to shoot. If you want to have something that is light and airy or a mood dark and moody. If you want to have a bright scene and you feel that the natural light is not enough, then you could use artificial light. But I would start by um, using a, 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 mood, a foam board, a white foam board, to um, reflect the, um, the natural light. Because um, as soon as the light is hitting the foam board, uh, you'll have um, the, yeah, when it hits the foam board, it will bounce and you'll have more light in your scene. So I would suggest you to use um, foam boards to uh, reflect the, um, the natural light that you already have. And then if you feel that it's not enough, then you could, you, you could use um, either a LED light or um, a, a strobe or a flash to get more light into your scene. Um, I'm going to see if we have other questions. Um, uh, we have one question from Mark. Do you recommend a 27 inch or 32 uh, inch monitor with a MacBook? Um, the uh, size of the monitor is totally depending on um, on you. So uh, you can use any kind of any size of the monitor together with your um, with your MacBook. And um, I think the most important is that it should be at least um, bigger or larger than uh, 24 inches. But yeah, everything above is perfect for um, photo editing. Um, Let's see if we have. Uh, then we have an, a question from John. What effect does a black bounce card have? So the uh, a black bounce card would absorb the light. So if you would use, uh, so for example, in the picture that you can see here above, uh, yeah, behind me. Um, not behind me, but on this slide, on the presentation slide with the oranges. There I was using a black foam card to absorb the light. And um, that way, because if I would have used a white foam board, the light would have bounced back on the oranges and I would have more light on the oranges. But here I wanted to have more shadows. So I used the black foam card to absorb the light. And I hope that's the answer to your question. Um, and uh, I have another question. It's in Swedish, so I'm going to try to uh, translate it into English. So do you use the lights uh, differently um, if you have matte uh, objects or um, shiny and glossy objects? And um, I think um, I, would, I wouldn't I would use the light differently, but I would probably direct it differently because we, I don't want it to be reflected in a shiny object. And um, if I want to um, have, if I want to avoid um, um, a reflection on a shiny object, then I would need to use um, 
uh, accessories like um, like a big uh, white uh, foam board that I would have to keep. For example, if I would, um, let's say I have a fork or a spoon that is uh, very shiny. So if I would take the picture from above, then you would most probably see me or the camera that is ref, uh, reflected in the spoon or the fork. Uh, but if you use um, something like a, a white foam board, then you would um, yeah, avoid that you would see uh, yourself or the camera. And it's something that you can retouch later too. But if you if you're shooting, I think if you're shooting matte objects, uh, it doesn't matter. But if you use if you're shooting reflecting objects, then it's important to um, to see how you're directing your light, but also how you're modifying it with the accessories. Um, and we have a question from Dustin. Um, do you use the same color checker to shoot both video and photo? I actually have um, two color checkers. I don't have them here with me um, right here, so I can't show you them, but uh, they look almost the same. And uh, I know that they're even uh, bigger for uh, videos, but there are two small, that, one small for video and um, uh, a small color checker passport for photo so that you can use. Uh, so I have the two of them. I'm not quite sure if you can use the one that is for photo for video, but I think the difference is the amount of um, the colors that are um, visible, that are in the color chart, but um, there are two different. Um, Then I have another question from Mehdi. Does the size of the color checker has any effect on the result? I think the size doesn't have any effect, but you have to make sure that the size of the color checker, when you're taking the picture of the reference um, image, you have to make sure that it takes um, around 10% of the image. So it shouldn't take too much more than 10% because then you would have uh, vignetting but not less than 10% either. So around 10% like um, in the image uh, that I showed you. And I think that's about it. Um, if you have any more questions, um, feel free to contact me on my uh, social medias. You have my uh, Instagram account or you can just drop me a message and I'll be more than happy to um, get back to you. And um, yeah, I, Thank you very much for attending the webinar. I hope it's been useful for you and that you're ready to experiment with light. And um, I would be more than happy to see your photos. And uh, thank you to uh, BenQ, Calibrite, and uh, Wex Photo and Video for hosting this webinar. Thank you and have a nice evening. Bye-bye.